Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ruth Taylor, and I am the chair of the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission. Welcome to Come Back to the Future, Rhode Island's 35th Historic Preservation Conference. Today, we gather across the traditional lands of the Narragansett, Niantic, Nipmunk, Pequot, and Wampanoag peoples from past to present. We recognize the long history of this land and the enduring connections that Indigenous people have to this place today. I want to take this opportunity to thank our agencies, commissioners, and staff for helping to make this event a success, which it is. Special thanks to Sarah Zurier and Julie Roper. Thank you as well to the speakers and tour guides for sharing your work with us today. And of course, we could not bring you this event without our generous sponsors. Look for them in the sponsor tab in the lobby. Special thanks to our lead sponsors, the National Park Service, Preserve Rhode Island, 1772 Foundation, Dalkey Management, and the Hale House. Today is day three of Rhode Island's 35th Historic Preservation Conference. We're starting with a keynote address from Kofi Boone, followed by six breakout sessions, plus many virtual tours, videos, and opportunities to chat face-to-face -face with colleagues in the networking lounges. Now, there are likely no aspects of this country's history and culture that will not be enriched by centering the lives and experiences of Black Americans. And it is also the case that the importance of landscape in our history and culture have been less examined. There is no one better to talk about these things with us today than Kofi Boone, university faculty scholar and professor in the Department of Landscape, Architecture, and Environmental Planning at North Carolina State University, College of Design. Kofi's work is in the overlap between landscape, architecture, and environmental justice, with specializations in democratic design, digital media, and interpreting cultural landscapes. Kofi serves on the advisory board of the Black Landscape Architects Network and on the board of directors of the CORE Foundation, as well as the Landscape Architecture Foundation, where he is president-elect. I am delighted to welcome Kofi to present Black Landscapes Matter. Thank you. Thank you for that gracious introduction. Uh, thank you to everybody at the conference for inviting me all the way from down south. So, as you'll discover in the presentation, I'm not really from down south, I just work down here. Uh, I'm glad that some of the things that I have to offer are of value to you, so I look forward to uh, the next few minutes with you. So with that, I will ask permission to share my screen and we can begin. Uh, as noted, the keynote is about the topic of Black Landscapes Matter, uh, and I will use this presentation to start to talk about some of the work that we've done and that we hope to do moving forward uh, to advance that agenda. And I was very excited to hear about uh, your conference theme this year. And it reminded me of my time teaching an international design studio in Ghana, West Africa. Uh, Ghana, the home of many things that are tied to African American and Black culture. One of those is the Dinkra stamps and one of uh, stamped cloth that's used particularly in ceremonies in Ghana. And one of those uh, Dinkra symbols is called Sankofa which literally translates in icon language as go back and fetch it, but it's better known as you can't know your future unless you know. Great to come full circle and discuss these particular issues. Uh, before we get into it, I'd like to offer some acknowledgements. Uh, one is uh, that I'm coming to you from the land of the Eno and the Saponi, the Lumbee, the Cherokee, and many other, and when we ask permission on this land uh, to share these words. I also come to you from the American Southeast in North Carolina, which was once a part of the Confederacy. And one of the uh, most impactful maps that I remember seeing when I first relocated here uh, was this map that's on the screen now. It's a census map from 1860 that catalogs by county in Confederate states the percent population of enslaved African people. So the darker the color, the higher the percentage. And it also works as a geology map because many of these early plantations, extractive and exploitive landscapes were based on a very keen understanding of the landscape, right? the most fertile areas for growing. And so you can see along the Mississippi River and down to the Delta and along South Carolina and the Eastern Seaboard, huge concentrations 
of enslaved African people. And so the land that I'm speaking from uh, has the dual uh, duty of uh, dealing with the legacy and the trauma and the reconciliation and reparations required for indigenous people, stolen land, enslaved African people, stolen labor tied to the legacy of this country. And when I was in school, one of my favorite photographers was Gordon Parks. Uh, Gordon Parks, uh, who shot this picture in Mobile, Alabama, this is not North Carolina, but in a way tried to capture the everyday lives of black people in the American South through this photo series. And in it, you see an elegantly dressed uh, woman and her child on a typical Main Street, and it connect, connotes a sense of dignity, a sense of, of, of pride, a sense of connection and, and, and aspiration. But as we know in the South and in many other places, this existed in a landscape and in a built environment that sent a very different signal that said that uh, we're not all human, uh, that we don't all matter, that we're not all equal. And so we often compartmentalize it and talk about it in terms of policy and people. But as people engaged in the built environment, particularly with history, it's time to engage the fact that part of the places that we canonize and that we celebrate were participants, active participants in that repression. And so the events of the last few years, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement have really been transformative for many of us to uh, take a pause and look at all of these systems and institutions and values that we perpetuate and can we rethink those in creative ways and we thank the young people who have been in the streets for now almost a year uh, for agitating and advocating for us uh, with gray hair to rethink some of these main conceptions and one of the most important people uh, one of the co-founders of the black lives matter movement, now part of the black futures lab alicia garza put it elegantly and actually informed a lot of the work that I've done in the past few years, where when asked what are really the demands and requirements that are being advocated for, she says, well, it's to be seen, right? The idea that there are stories and there are lives that aren't seen in our mainstream understandings of place and environments. To live with dignity, uh, that dignity doesn't mean wealth, dignity doesn't mean uh, political power, dignity means an affirming landscape that edifies and supports who you are as a person, uh, the cultural traditions that are important to you, provide a setting for those to be passed along to the next generation. Key component of civilization is the environment. And finally, to be connected, that your situation and what you're going through is not, you're not alone, that you're a part of a broader uh, set of circumstances and that through collective action and networking, we can work together to achieve them. And so beginning, we start with the commentary of Up South, uh, and I'm from Detroit, and it's interesting, Malcolm X, uh, who spent many of his years in Detroit, referred to the North as Up South as a way of breaking down that uh, binary of Northern progressiveness and Southern uh, conservatism, that there are, particularly from the African-American Black culture experience, there are things in the North that are just as difficult and challenging as being in the South. Uh, this is my family uh, in Detroit on the east side, my mom, my dad, my sister and I and grew up in a working class family, but, you know, relatively uh, comfortable uh, growing up and a, a sense of agency. Uh, when people talk about Detroit, it's often from a traumatic and a deficit mindset, but I think about it from an asset standpoint that's influenced me for most of my life. This is an image of the Detroit River and kids playing in the river at Belle Isle Park, looking back at downtown Detroit. And so I have many fond memories of that great historic landscape. Uh, the master plan for Belle Isle Park, of course, uh, set in motion by Frederick Lohmstead, who will be celebrating his 200th birthday next year. So a part of his role in contact with the city of Detroit was providing large scale public spaces, in his mind for civilizing people. Uh, also the context of modernism, where Detroit was a global leader in design and creativity in the mid 20th century because of the auto industry and attracted the best and the brightest from around the world. Here are the Saarinen's uh, who uh, designed uh, Cranbrook uh, Academy and uh, a place in north of Detroit that I've referred to and worked with uh, many times, uh, both as a resident of the city and also as a professional. But also another part of Detroit uh, that we that grappled with and dealt with the Heidelberg Project, uh, a legacy project from great artist Tyree Guyton, uh, 
uh, who felt he was informed by the spirits of his father and his ancestors to go out in the street and literally paint polka dots and to reclaim lost items and accumulate them and in mass make huge political public art statements in everyday neighborhoods uh, to talk about the duality, the growth of the city, the decline, the perception of people being leftovers, no place for them, really aggregating them and putting them in your face. And so all of these design currents were a part of me growing up. Something that I did not fully understand uh, growing up was uh, the legacy of policies that were aggressive and uh, actually did great damage to landscapes and particularly black landscapes and black communities. Uh, this is Hastings Street in a part of Detroit called Black Bottom uh, before uh, uh, World War II and was really one of the most important cultural centers and economic and political centers in the city and one of the most important ones in the Midwest. And in the post-war era, uh, when we talk about the legacy of urban renewal and we talk about freeways and we talk about a lot of these progressive components in part meant to strengthen our region and to protect us uh, at that time from the Red Scare, the fear of nuclear annihilation, this intentional policy of decentralization and spreading out our communities, which devastated all of our major cities. Uh, we learned that freeways and urban renewal and redlining uh, were all tools specifically targeted to African-American communities, black communities across the country, and did incredible harm, uh, removing a lot of the fabric that we require to sustain our communities. Mindy Fuller Love Thompson, uh, the great uh, social scientist and author of a book called Root Shock, uh, talks about this as serial displacement. Root Shock, the psychological effects of losing one's home place. And in Root Shock, the book, she talks about uh, the impacts of urban renewal on the Hill District of Pittsburgh and the South Bronx in New York and how that dispersed populations and led to generational trauma. And she locates that in a timeline that goes back to the period of enslavement but as you start to get to the 20th century, you can see how there's so many more dots on the timeline. Uh, intentional policies funded by the federal government, uh, overseen by uh, uh, laws uh, that really devastated communities every generation uh, from the 1940s forward. And we're still trying to pick up the pieces uh, from that devastation. And in my hometown of Detroit, uh, redlining, uh, the great book, The Color of Law by Rothstein, which I'd strongly recommend if you haven't read it, outlines in great detail how uh, in the 1930s decisions were made about home loans and business investment, infrastructure improvements in communities strictly on the basis of race. And that if you were in a red line, that was a boundary that defined no uh, investment, uh, no confidence that loans should be uh, pursued. Uh, and so when you think about the generational impact from the 1930s forward, the lack of wealth moving forward, the lack of uh, investment to maintain communities, business, homes, specifically on the basis of race, we have a lot of work to do. So we'll begin with uh, the first proposition from uh, Alicia Garza, the idea of being seen and how our work can help to reveal uh, stories and elucidate ideas that we're not always familiar with. Uh, I tend to start this version of the story with uh, before um, many of the states were founded, uh, during the period of enslavement, it's a horrible, traumatic period uh, that brings forward uh, powerful energy and powerful feelings, but it's something that needs to be recovered in the broader story. And uh, begin with Middleton Place in Charleston, South Carolina, and a period of time when Carolina uh, was uh, didn't have a, a prominent cash crop, right? So they added, there was no uh, real agricultural product that they figured out how to make in that landscape. Uh, that could fuel uh, the engine of the new colonies. And the understanding that in West Africa, the Wolof people now in modern day Senegal had for centuries at, by that time perfected rice production, uh, that they had generated uh, the engineering, the strategies, what we would call landscape uh, for centuries before uh, the start of this. And so people caught wind of this idea that there was a specific group of people we celebrate Middleton Place in landscape architecture history for many reasons that are valid. The beautiful butterfly uh, ponds uh, that really marked the entry, right? So this is at a time when you would use the river as the entry to the plantation. The terracing, the first camellia planted in the continental United States was on this particular site. And so from a garden history and a landscape history, it's well, well regarded. Uh, but what we don't talk about is the role of rice, 
and the role in particular of Carolina Gold, uh, not just in uh, providing the resources to enrich this particular plantation, but the United States as a whole. It was a transformative crop uh, that really led to the incredible wealth that South Carolina enjoyed for decades to come. And the fact that specific African people were targeted for enslavement because of their knowledge of rice production. So in addition to having centuries of this uh, knowledge, uh, the sickle cell anemia trait was prominent in the Volov people as well. One of the unfortunate uh, side effects of sickle cell trait is a measure of malaria resistance. You have to imagine an American landscape that was mostly swamp, uh, that was very hostile to people of European descent. We were not able to deal with malaria. And so not only were these people uh, targeted for their knowledge about rice production, but also for public health, their resistance to a deadly disease. And so there are records of, you know, decades of work uh, by African people in enslavement, translating the technologies that they developed in Africa into the United States that helped build some of the fundamental wealth. of the country. You can go around to multiple plantations and this challenges the notion that this was just labor, that these were just dumb brutes. Uh, out uh, just executing the plans of more intelligent and more enterprising Europeans. It was not the case. In some cases, it was the opposite. And Middleton was one of those places. So it's important to start at that root and say that even in, under great duress, there was this imperative to translate and, um, and reproduce uh, uh, landscape traditions uh, that were well-grounded and well-founded, even in a new hostile land. So the next time you go to Middleton Place and other plantations, you may go on a tour and they may spend time talking about gardens. And they may start time talking about the more decorative and picturesque parts of it. But the integral to this landscape is its means of production. And so part of this argument is saying that we shouldn't bifurcate the economic and the political and the social systems that enable the beauty and the recreation that we all enjoy. Those should all be in the same story and in that way, acknowledging prominently uh, the uh, the role of African people in African culture. Uh, to live th with dignity, the next proposition. And in this, we can talk about some seminal figures coming out of the end of, uh, of, of uh, enslavement and the Civil War and Reconstruction. You know, what did Black people and Black communities do, right? So many of them were interested in institution building for the first time, having the right to be educated, to build towns, to build uh, other institutions was really that imperative. And so one of the most prominent players in this is the guy in the middle of this picture, uh, Booker T. Washington, who's sitting with uh, the board and uh, several of his faculty for the Tuskegee Institute. Also in this picture is Robert Taylor. Robert Taylor, the first African-American architect to graduate from a predominantly white institution, uh, MIT. And George Washington Carver, who deserves a whole conference on his own. It's, uh, any components. Uh, the founding of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama was critical uh, to this. In the same way that University of Virginia was envisioned by Thomas Jefferson as a way to perpetuate the principles of democracy, vision people coming to uh, the Great Lawn and UVA in Charlottesville and, and learning about the values of American democracy, training and learning about why that's important and taking those lessons out to the rest of the world. Uh, Booker T. Washington saw Tuskegee Institute in the same way that this would become a place for uh, black people uh, to learn about the value of institution building, of really investing in place, uh, having those skill sets that allow people for self-sustainability and then translating out to other places. And Robert Taylor, uh, he recruited to be the architect uh, to deal with that campus. What Robert did, which is really interesting in their ethic was if you went to Tuskegee at this time, uh, you'd be in the classroom, say, you know, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. But Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday, you'd be building the campus. They were making glass, they were making bricks, they were putting foundations up for buildings, they were making roads. These are the students. You can imagine that today if our students and if we were in the academic space, not only were we in the place learning lessons, but we were actively engaged in the making of landscapes on campuses. Tuskegee is the most prominent example of this sort of combination of applied, real, uh, building knowledge integrated into what we think of as higher education, but there are others, uh, particularly at HBCUs, that 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 normalized this and made this a part of the process. You know, this work attracted interest. So Julius Rosenwald, the gentleman on the left, was CEO of the Sears and Roebuck Company, 
uh, and uh, made it you know, through a friendship with Booker T. Washington, uh, were concerned about the incredible uh, disparity in school facilities across the South. Of course, although uh, uh, African Americans are free in the South during Jim Crow, they weren't really free, and that also translated into disparities in uh, infrastructure and, and, and other elements. And so created the Julius Rosenwald Fund, which was a matching grant program where if communities could uh, put up half of a certain amount of money required to build a new school facility, the fund would pay for the other half. And they had a pattern book, and which we'll talk about in a second, of uh, state-of-the-art school facilities. And so they would, they would help you to build a school. This is uh, the cover of one from Nashville, uh, Tennessee, that not only just dealt with the school, but also uh, best practices at that time for the landscape, for school yards and natural ventilation and uh, 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 light and air and a lot of the things that were at that time called sanitary, today we would call sustainable. Uh, these are some examples of some of the pattern books that were used uh, in the development of these schools. And these were literally state of the art. They were equal, not superior to the ones that were in other places. And many black communities, um, including one we'll talk about in a few minutes in Princeville, North Carolina, actually raised all the money and didn't accept the match and built the schools themselves. And so there are schoolyards all across the United States in schools that came out of the Rosenwald Fund. You know, over 5,000 completed, the most are in North Carolina um, that uh, still remain, uh, that are landscapes, that are evidence of the application of best practices uh, usually implemented by local people and grass people uh, that we pass by and don't pay attention to every day. Wonderful facilities. You know, around this same period of time, we talked about Robert Taylor, but there were others uh, that were pursuing more mainstream uh, approaches to architecture and not restricting their talents and their gifts uh, to uh, black communities. And so uh, where I live, I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, I would say with a little bit of chagrin because I went to Michigan and uh, I was at Michigan when we lost back to back in the national title game to Duke and to UNC. So it's sort of tough being in North Carolina right now. But I do understand and recognize the value of Duke's campus, Duke West campus, uh, the Duke family, of course, uh, in Durham, who perfected the curing of bright leaf tobacco and rose to prominence and fortune, purchased Trinity College, which is now Duke's East Campus, which is integrated into the town of Durham but wanted to build an idealized uh, sort of Gothic revival campus, which is now referred to as Duke's West Campus. It was done by Trumbauer and the architect of the chapel, which is the most striking structure, is really the icon of the campus as well as its core buildings, was Julian Abel. Julian Abel, the first African-American architect who graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who worked at Trumbauer, who was a, a really a, a student of, of Gothic revival uh, style. Uh, the Olmsted brothers uh, did the landscape planning, but he's credited with the main courtyard as well as his main, main buildings. But importantly, never visited the site because of race. So there were rumors that he dressed, it, dressed as a uh, worker uh, to kind of sneak in and see how his work was going. But his, for all of his brilliance, he was never able to actually step foot on the great campus that he designed. So this indicates that duality that we speak of. Uh, in some cases, it's different, right? So Howard University, and in this picture, what's known as the yard, the central gathering space of Howard University in Washington, D.C., prominent historical black college university, the alma mater of our vice president right now, Kamala Harris, uh, written about extensively by ta Coates and Between the World and Me as an important mixing ground for black people from not just around the country, but around the world, an important place that's led to leadership, you know, the home of incredible, you know, uh, gatherings uh, that go beyond the influence of the particular campus. Uh, that landscape and that space was designed by the first African-American landscape architect, the first one to go through formal training in the United States, David Williston, native of Fayetteville, North Carolina, a graduate of Cornell University, uh, who spent much of his career dealing with residential landscapes, but in fact was the designer of that great space that still continues to provide cultural reinforcement to this day. Uh, we get to the third proposition to be connected, right? So how the work uh, is not just about what happens in that particular place, but how it's tied to building uh, 
allegiances, gathering resources, and extending the network to increase the influence and the agency of people. And we've spent uh, several years working with one place in particular, Princeville, North Carolina, particularly after Hurricane Matthew, uh, which we're coming on the third uh, anniversary of that. Uh, this image comes to us from the Cultural Landscape Foundation, uh, the, the great organization led by Charles Birnbaum, uh, Grounds of Democracy, where we made the case that Princeville should be included in the story of American democracy, because among other things, it was founded as Freedom Hill in 1865, and by that count, it is among the first black towns founded by free black people in the United States. Uh, there's sort of a three-way tie between Eatonville and Florida, Mount Bayou in Mississippi, but uh, as Freedom Hill, it's right in that conversation, formalized as Princeville, named after a prominent carpenter, Turner Prince. Uh, tragically built on the banks of the Tar River uh, in the low-lying area. So ironically named Freedom Hill because it was actually founded in a swamp because in the American Southeast, the land that was available to free black people to buy was often the marginalized land that whites did not want. And so this idea of this constant uh, resilience kind of baked into uh, the, the town's history and the constant need to recover and to rebuild turns out is not unique to Princeville. In the Southeast, uh, there's a term that's used called racialized topography that explains this phenomenon where you can predict race and altitude. Uh, how high or how low a pla place is, is an indicator of its demographics and its racial composition because of these legacy conditions of land ownership, relegating low-lying areas, which are at more risk for flooding and, and storm events than other places uh, to black and brown people. But it also exists in a big political matrix. And I think that this is also somewhat transferable beyond our region, is that it's in the, the historic second district, which produced many of uh, our uh, national political leaders from North Carolina. Uh, uh, Reverend William Barber, who you may have heard of, uh, who's leading the Poor People's Campaign here, kind of picking up the mantle uh, from Dr. Martin Luther King from many years ago, uh, was from this historic district. And there are many other indicators, freedom roads, the pathways that African Americans uh, freedom on the Underground Railroad, other elements uh, that are layered uh, within the context of that. Uh, tragically, because of the storms and because of the flooding, a lot of the infrastructure of the town that doesn't exist. So those black and white pictures of what that town used to be have been lost uh, to uh, numerous floods and disasters. And I would say that that's a big issue as we deal with climate change is the uh, lack of protection and the lack of foresight and planning for communities that we know are going to be in harm's way. So a lack of dedication to documentation, planning and engaging communities. And I would say that that's the charge that we should take up is to help these communities prepare for what's to come. Uh, but we've tried to. We've worked for the past three years in various entities to try and uh, celebrate uh, and build off of this town's culture and connect based on these stories. And just a short story before we move on. Uh, as a part of that, we did a uh, summer camp uh, for uh, young people, uh, what you would call at-risk youth, but what we would call at-promise youth. So people who aren't necessarily doing the best in school, uh, who need a little bit of motivation and a little bit of focus. Uh, in our area, about an hour and a half away from Princeville and Raleigh, and so a number of high school kids we brought to Princeville. Uh, we walked Princeville and told the stories. This is one of the most important stops. Uh, we hired local people to lead these stories, and so the young ladies in the front are actual Princeville residents who are telling the story of Princeville. What they're looking at is the Tar River. This is the source of the flooding uh, that produced all these challenges, and they're looking north to Virginia, and that was the last navigable point for boats uh, containing enslaved African people. They would have to disembark from that point to smaller boats, get to the coast, to the shore, and then walk two miles to be sold at the slave block in Charbro, the county seat. And so that was the beginning of the tour, and it naturally captured the interest of kids, and they had lots of questions. Important. We went to the museum and the Welcome Center, which resembles a Rosenwald school, but as we discovered later, is not a Rosenwald. That gives you a sense of uh, the legacy of that program, uh, which had been converted into uh, sort of a visitor center, but as you can tell from the picture, it was still damaged from the storm. And so there was a lot of frustration from these kids about, hey, I wish we had a place where we could learn more about this particular story. And uh, serendipity, um, 
had a conversation with the head of the School of Architecture at NC State, a uh, great, great designer and, and educator, um, uh, David Hill. And uh, his architecture design build studio for that summer had just fallen through. The client that they had been negotiating with for the students to work uh, had pulled out and decided they didn't want to participate, but they still had funds from a donor. And I said, hey, I just talked with all these high school kids. And, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was something we could do about this museum idea? And what they talked about was a mobile museum. I said, hey, if this place floods, why isn't the museum on wheels? You know, why can't we put it on the back of a truck and pull it away? And, you know, it's one of these moments, you know, where the naive kids kind of leads to some brilliant ideas. And we had a whole conversation and we talked with town council of Princeton, like, look, you know, we have this idea of a mobile museum, a place that you could use in the short term as a place to continue telling your story until the permanent museum is renovated. And once the permanent museum is renovated, you could take this thing on the road. It could be at the Smithsonian, it could be at the state capitol, it could be at schools, it could be at festivals. You could actually take the story uh, to the audiences that you want to deal with. And so in eight weeks, the architecture students actually did that. They built a Princeville Mobile Museum. You see that it was designed as a way of being almost like a billboard, right? So uh, 1885, its founding date as Princeville. Uh, Corten steel, which is a metaphor, it gets stronger the more it weathers and more it's exposed to elements. So tied to the resilient spirit of that particular community. It's an air conditioned space. It's a day lit space. And there's a temporary exhibit in it there now, photography from people from the town of Princeville, and it's currently being used very prominently as they move forward uh, with their work. And it's inspired a broader movement. So the idea that Princeville, even though it's faced all of these challenges due to uh, repetitive flooding, that there is a future for it. And this idea of greater Princeville has now started to take on a life of its own. Um, our last story before we close uh, for questions and discussion uh, is Raleigh, uh, our state capital. Uh, in North Carolina, and just an anecdote about Raleigh. William Christmas, the surveyor who laid out the plan as a planned capital city, uh, Raleigh, took the plan of Philadelphia, rotated it 90 degrees, put the capital where Independence Hall is at the high point uh, between Walnut Creek and Crabtree Creek and called it Raleigh. So we're kind of a shrunken down model of Philadelphia. But adjacent to that is the South Park East Raleigh neighborhood. Uh, which was initially Freedman's land right after the end of the Civil War, some of the first land that African-American in our area, uh, and also uh, one of the first uh, streetcar suburbs, but a segregated one, uh, so one specifically for african -Americans. That gives you a sense of scale and detail. And uh, the Negro Park, uh, which was an open area uh, in the middle of that particular community, uh, that was designated as the park for African Americans in our region. And just to let you know by comparison, this is the evidence of Jim Crow and segregation. A mile away is the White Park, Pullen Park. Uh, so separate but equal facilities, uh, which we'll get into in a second, was sort of the order of the day. The federal government came in and doubled down and said, hey, this is a place for affordable housing and for infrastructure and for other elements. And in many ways, Chavis Park, what is now known as Chambers Park, which we'll talk about why in a second, was one of the first uh, mixed use developments in Raleigh. It was one of the first places where people conceived of open space, institutions, housing, and other elements. Uh, the Negro Park, uh, initially called uh, residents from this particular community, black residents came forward to the federal government and said, hey, we'd like to rename this to John Chavis Park, Chavis Park, because John Chavis was the first educator in North Carolina that was allowed to teach both black and white students, and he, uh, his home place, his residence was in this particular neighborhood, successful in that name change. Uh, decline, so decades of decline, where Pullen Park was invested in, and this is one of the interesting unintentional consequences, I think, of desegregation, which was the city of Raleigh decided that if they wanted, it was ridiculous to have two park facilities less than a mile away with the exact same facilities. Uh, they thought everybody could use Pullen Park, Right. So they started to pull money and resources out of Chavis Park and downgrade it to more of a neighborhood park and and take those resources and invest in Pullen Park. So this included amusements and Olympic size swimming pool, many other things that were in both places that were removed from one park and then restored in another. It led to incredible uh, conflict in this particular community who recalled the history and the legacy of this particular place. Uh, we got involved because many of their stories 
did not have archival information or evidence. And we were trying to find new ways to get these stories out there. And so we experimented with digital technology as a way to deal with that, uh, mobile phones in particular. And what you see here are two women from this particular neighborhood who for the first time learned how to record a self-authored digital video using a mobile device. And we said, we talked to AT&T, you got free phones and free service uh, for a few weeks. And, and we said, hey, you go through this training thing, walk around the community, the neighborhood, tell stories, the phone will automatically map where these stories are and we'll aggregate these things into a map. And for the first time we'll have uh, what Stevie Wonder would call a talking book, a way of describing these particular issues. One of the stories that was uncovered that helped to give this part prominence was at the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was founded next door at Shaw University, really adjacent to the park. Uh, the initial meetings and initial trainings happened in the park. So SNCC, as we now know, the great work of Ella Baker, uh, legacy extended to uh, John Lewis, uh, who was president of SNCC for a period of time. Uh, its origins were in this park. So everything from self-defense techniques for women, uh, walking into hostile situations to the like all happened in the park that was revealed through stories. And this is just a small sample of that map, the, the talking map that tells people uh, the stories, the Chavis Park stories. This helped Chavis Park get a national register designation. It was used as a point of evidence to join the National Register of Historic Places, which it is now. Uh, it was used as evidence for a bond issue uh, for improvements to the park, $17.5 million to reconcile that extended period of disinvestment. Here we see some of the ladies that we worked with initially at the groundbreaking for that particular element. And at the end of June, this center will be open. This is the brand new John Chavis Memorial Park Center that for the first time celebrates prominently uh, the history of that particular neighborhood uh, to the public. So we're excited about the ribbon cutting for that. Uh, as we close, I want to remind people that the National Park Service has the Historic American Landscape Survey Challenge going on right now for historic black landscapes. They're looking for people to document them. Their documentation process is less uh, 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 onerous than some of the more formal ones. And so they, they designed this process to be somewhat straightforward. And uh, their deadline is in July. So if there are black landscapes in your place or wherever you are that really have not been documented or talked about, uh, there's an open call to include those. And I would also like to give thanks to my big brother in the profession and my hero and uh, uh, somebody I admire a great deal, Walter Hood, uh, of course, uh, MacArthur uh, Award winner from several years ago, who's doing incredible work uh, in the contemporary landscape, particularly in Charleston, South Carolina right now, telling some of these stories uh, in a very explicit way uh, through his work. And uh, the title of this talk is from an article that he asked for uh, from a symposium I participated in and it's prominently featured in his book by the same title, which I would encourage you to take a look at, Black Landscapes Matter. That I'll say thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kofi. So I'm gonna just read for you over here in the Q&A. We've got a question from Arnold. Arnold wants to know, are there historic sites in the U.S. that do a thorough and equitable job of telling the story of the means of production to visitors both in person and virtual? It's a good question. Um, it's not something that I've investigated, so I'm not going to speak as an authority on that particular topic, um, and particularly with, with Black folks. It's been a major uh, point of revision for a lot of places. So uh, as a point of departure, I remember going to Monticello uh, when I was in college. And at that time, there was no acknowledgement of the period of enslavement at all. Like you'd go to the gardens and then you'd go to the house and then you know they'd point over to the side, like that's where the slaves were and then you kind of left, right? Uh, but there's been an incredible push there uh, to start to use different tools to talk about uh, the complicated history that Jefferson had with black people uh, and with slavery. Uh, and uh, Sally Hemings thing, you know, being one part of the story for sure. But uh, they have uh, started to build educational programming and restoration and reconstruction projects that include virtual reality. So this is something that's interesting where they're 
some of the places they've decided not to reconstruct, but they've started to create online digital experiences uh, that can provide a more detailed, nuanced, and multimedia way of talking about the role of enslaved African people on that site. And so I think that uh, the work that they're doing to start to recover that story is probably still um, close to the, the front of that. Thank you. Um, from Denise, by 2030 and certainly by 2050, the U.S. minority population will be the majority. How would you envision this change will impact on the future story of Black landscapes? It's a really good question. We do talk about those benchmarks a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, 2030 for us in some ways is also important because that's a point of no return uh, for carbon and for climate. And so this idea of making sure the global temperature doesn't increase by more than one and a half degrees Celsius by 2030 is a thing, 2040. And I think that number is starting to cycle forward. That's right. There will be no uh, the white people, people identify as white, will no longer be states. And so uh, it is forcing a rethink of a lot of things. What I would say is um, I would encourage uh, efforts to talk about the impact of those changes on physical places, how we think about our environment. Uh, I think those changes will impact education, it will impact economics, it will impact politics, but a lot of how we've thought about empowerment with black and brown communities has been portable and mobile, and we still need to have real conversations about investing in actual places that embody those values. So I think there's a need for some advocacy for that, but I can see that happening, um, and, and I hope it does. With that, I don't see any other open questions in the Q&A. Um, if anyone has any further questions and wants to add them or add them in the chat, we can address them now. Um, but otherwise, Kofi, thank you. And if you want to just add any final thoughts, we can wrap it up and um, we can continue the conversation in the 10 a.m. panel discussion. Yeah, I'd, I'd again like to say thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you today. I do invite you to participate in the panel. I think it will be an interesting conversation that's more specific to issues in Rhode Island. Uh, still something that I'm learning about, and so I'm excited to participate in it as well. And, and, and I appreciate you all uh, uh, making time uh, for this important conversation. Fantastic. And one one last quick question from Martha. Uh, she asks if you can please repeat the name of the book you mentioned about redlining. Redlining. It's called The Color of Law. The Color of Law. It's by Rothstein. It's excellent. It's by far the best uh, description of the far reaching impacts of that really important era in the early 20s. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kofi, for that incredible presentation. And everyone, please enjoy the rest of the conference.